Hey, welcome to Tabletop Skirmish Games. I'm Lee, and in part six of our How to Play Core Space, we'll be looking at the Trader Phase. In the previous video, we looked at the order of play. So now let's look at the Trader Phase in detail, including the player's turn and the actions they can make. In the Trader Phase, the players take it in turns to activate their traders. The player holding the turn counter goes first and then play continues clockwise around the table, each player activating one character at a time until all traders have been activated. When it is a player's turn to activate a trader, they do the following four steps. Step one, choose one of their traders to activate. This cannot be a character that has been marked with an activation counter. In step two, Take actions with the trader, allowing them to move, shoot, interact with the terrain and more. Step 3. When you have finished, place an activation counter on the trader's dashboard to remind you that they cannot act again this round. And then finally, step 4. Play passes to the next player clockwise around the table. When all traders on the board have been activated, move on to the purge phase. A trader's action statistic that we covered in previous videos shows how many actions they can take in a turn. Most characters have two, but some have more. You can choose to use all, some, or none of them when activating your character. The most common actions that can be taken are as follows. They can move, make a ranged assault, a close assault, they can knock back, search, reload, persuade, or interact. In this video, we'll go through these common actions, and then in future videos, we'll also look at effortless actions. In addition to the common actions, a character can take effortless actions. These do not count towards your action limit, but you can only take one of them per turn. Prone characters cannot take any actions other than standing up, after which they can then act normally and defeated characters cannot take any actions at all until they have been revived by another character. And again, we're gonna go over these two things in more detail in later videos. Let's start now with the move action. Movement in core space is measured in inches using the range ruler provided. Characters can move in any direction, but cannot move through or over terrain unless specified otherwise. Characters can move through other friendly characters, but cannot move through enemies without permission, and note that enemy NPCs will never give permission. When a character takes a move action, they can move up to four inches as marked on the ruler. This is measured from the edge of their base. You will note, however, that the maximum move is 11 inches. No matter how many actions a character spends moving, and no matter what abilities they may have, they can never voluntarily move more than 11 inches in a single round. They may still be knocked back by an enemy or moved involuntary by an effect. There's also a rule called attacks of opportunity. If a character leaves base contact with one or more enemies, either at the start or during their move, all standing, engaged enemies can make a free close assault action against the moving character, regardless of whether they have already activated this turn. This action is resolved immediately and does not use any of their actions for the turn. There's also some movement rules to note when entering and leaving the ship. Traders will start the game inside their ship's airlock. To enter the board, their first action of the game must be a move action, measured from the airlock door. Traders that wish to return to the ship can also do so with a move action, again measured to the airlock door at the board edge. Note that once a character has left the board and returned to their ship, they are out of the game and cannot return. Enemy traders and NPCs may not enter a player's ship without their permission. That's the movement action taken care of, so now let's start working our way through assault actions. An assault action allows one character to attack another. There are two types of assault action. A close assault action, made with a character's fists or a hand-to-hand -hand combat weapon, or a ranged assault action made with a ballistic, chemical or energy weapon. Both types are similar in execution, except for the positioning of the attacker and their target. Each allows the character 
to make an attack. Close assault attacks can only be made against enemies in base contact with your character. Ranged assault attacks are made at a distance against targets within line of sight and range of your character's weapon. They cannot be made against targets in base contact with your character. Otherwise, both types of attacks are made in the same way. We roll a combat dice for the weapon as shown on its token or on your character profile if fighting unarmed. The number of these icons rolled are your hits. Next we apply any applicable modifiers to the roll such as cover or armour, altering the number of hits scored. Some special rules and skills may apply further modifiers. Then any remaining hits cause damage. If targeting a trader, reduce the target's health by one for each point of damage. If their health reaches zero, the character is defeated. Lay the character on their side. They will remain there until moved or revived. If targeting an NPC, unless stated otherwise, the character is instantly defeated and removed from play if they take damage. Any items they were carrying are left on the ground where they fell. Note that certain rules or cards will also call for attacks to be made against a target. These are carried out in the same way, but will specify the number of dice to roll rather than referring to a character or weapon. Unless stated otherwise, such attacks do not have an origin and therefore cover modifiers do not apply. Now let's look at misfires. This icon on the dice signifies a misfire or weapon malfunction. If two or more of these icons are rolled during an attack, the weapon jams or breaks and no damage is caused. Range weapons are jammed. Rotate the token 180 degrees in your dashboard. Clearing a jammed range weapon costs one action. Close assault weapons are broken and flip the item face down in the tray in your dashboard. Broken weapons cannot be used again during this game. They will be repaired automatically after the game if playing a campaign. If you're fighting unarmed or your weapon has this icon, then this result have no effect. If a live one is defeated during the game, then the first trader to defeat a live one in a mission takes the live one kill point counter. This counter is exchanged in the advancement phase after the game and we'll cover that in a later video. Now let's look at armour. Hits sustained in an attack can be reduced by armour. There are two types of armour, physical and shield. Each token will have numbers shown on them like these. Physical armour has a permanent effect while it is worn, reducing the number of hits scored in an attack against the wearer by the physical armour value on the counter. For example, if a character with a combat vest with a physical armour value of 1 suffers 2 hits, the armour will deflect or absorb one of those hits, but the other will get through and cause damage. This will happen each time the character is attacked. Shield armour, however, is energy based and if beaten will be rendered inactive for the rest of the game. If a character with shield armour takes hits up to and including the shield armour value, the attack is resolved just like physical armour that we just covered. However, if enough hits get through to damage the wearer, the shield has been overloaded and cannot be used for the rest of the mission. Flip the token face down. It will recharge between missions in a campaign. For example, if a character with a shield belt with a shield armour value of 1 suffers 1 hit, it will be deflected as normal and the armour will continue to work. If the character suffers 2 hits, 1 would be deflected, 1 would cause damage and the armour would be rendered inactive. If for any reason a character has both physical and shield armour at the same time, they will use the highest value available. If these values are equal, the shield armour takes priority. Some armour will also allow the character to attack with it in close assault as detailed in the next part of this video. And that brings us nicely on to close assault. To attempt a close assault attack, the enemy must be engaged with your character. You may either fight unarmed, if it's possible, or choose one of your character's close assault weapons to attack with. You will then choose whether you want to make a standard hit or a heavy hit and roll the number of dice that you can see here in these icons. 
Standard hits ignore these results. Heavy hits have a chance of breaking the weapon and this symbol here results will apply as normal. Cover does not apply to close assault attacks but armour will apply as normal. Note that some armour includes an unarmed combat icon. This can be used in a close assault attack like any other weapon. These icons do not stack and a character will use one or the other. Now we're on to ranged assault. To attempt a ranged assault attack, the target must be within range and line of sight and cannot be engaged with your character. If you are engaged with one or more enemies while making a ranged attack, they may make an attack of opportunity against your character. You must choose one of your character's ranged weapons to attack with and roll a number of dice based on the range between the shooter and target. The most common modifier applied to ranged attacks is cover. Partial cover will reduce the number of hits on a target by one. This is always resolved before any other modifiers such as armor. And one important thing to note is that making a ranged attack reduces your ammo, so remove an ammo peg from your dashboard. After the first ranged assault action made by a trader in each round, place the peg in the hostility tracker instead of discarding it. You can easily remember if this has happened already this round because the last peg in the hostility tracker will be yellow instead of black. Only one ammo peg is placed in the hostility tracker per round. There are some rules that apply to shooting at engaged characters and characters that are engaged with each other will be constantly moving, raining down blows or dodging aside and they make for difficult targets when shooting. If you want to shoot at an enemy engaged with another character just check the following. At short range, you can freely pick your target. You're close enough to pick your moment and aim straight. At medium or long range, after rolling to hit, you must roll the chance die to determine which of the combatants you have hit, even if one of them is your own character. Modifiers such as cover and armor are worked out based on the actual target hit. There are some common ranged attack icons to be aware of for ranged assault. The first one is burst fire plus one. You may add one combat die to your attack, but you must remove one extra ammo peg. You'll also see burst fire plus two. You may add up to two combat dice to your attack, but you must remove the same number of extra ammo pegs. Then we've got this one, the full charge shot. You may empty your weapon in one powerful blast you must have at least four ammo pegs remaining and all of them are removed. Based on the number of pegs removed, either add two combat dice to your attack if four to five ammo pegs were removed or add three combat dice to your attack if six to seven ammo pegs were removed. This icon is for infinite ammo. This weapon does not use any ammo pegs and can be fired if you have no ammo, but one peg must still be added to the hostility tracker from the supply. Then we've got the reliable icon. This weapon ignores these results. Next it's target lock and this weapon ignores partial cover and can fire at engaged characters at any range without randomizing the target. Next we've got silent and this weapon does not add a peg to the hostility tracker. And then finally we've got dangerous. After the shot is fired the user suffers an attack with a number of combat dice equal to the number in the icon. Now we're on to the knockback action. A knockback action allows you to shove or misdirect another character in base contact, pushing them away. To knock back another character, roll dice equal to your character's unarmed combat value if they have one, or one die if they do not. For each hit scored, the defending model is pushed one inch directly away from the attacker Armour has no effect. The attacker can follow up to remain in base contact with the defender if they wish and have not already moved their maximum distance this round. None of these moves attract attacks of opportunity. If you score three or more hits, the defending model is then knocked prone. If the space directly behind the defender is blocked by other characters or terrain, they are pushed in the closest possible direction instead. If there is no space to push an opponent back, they do not move. If you roll any of these symbols, you have misjudged the attack and stumble. The action is not resolved 
and the opposing model can immediately make a free knockback action against you instead. If they also roll this symbol, then there is no effect. Massive characters, marked with this icon, use the number within the icon like armour against knockbacks, reducing the number of hits. They also add this many automatic hits to their own knockback attempts. Now we're on to search actions. Search actions allow a character to look around and find new items and will often be the key to victory in a mission. There are two types of search action. The first is to search a crate. Characters may search any cargo crate they're in base contact with, as long as they are not engaged with an enemy. Open the cargo crate and remove the contents, keeping the tokens hidden from other players. The player can add any or all of the contents to their character's dashboard. Any remaining items, any of their own items that they no longer want or have room for, are placed back in the cargo crate. Crates can be searched any number of times in a game. The next type of search is a general search, and characters may also do a general search of the room they're in as long as they are not engaged with an enemy and there are no enemies in the room. A room is defined as an area completely surrounded by either walls or the edges of the board, ignoring doors and windows. Each room can only be searched once per mission. Add a search counter to the room to remind you that it cannot be searched again. When you make a general search, take a random item from the token pouch. If you wish, you may add it to your character's dashboard. If you don't want the item, or you want to swap it with an item you already hold, place the discarded item on the floor in base contact with your character. And it's important to note that most of the time, the separation of rooms on the board is obvious, but players may agree to separate very large rooms or long corridors into multiple areas so that each can be searched separately. Now let's look at persuade actions. NPCs can often be persuaded to do certain things, such as trade an item with you or even join your crew. To do so, you must be in base contact with the NPC you are trying to persuade and not engage with any other enemy. Characters can be persuaded to do a few things, and the first is to trade an item. If they are carrying an item, you may swap it for one of your own, and this only applies to the small items. If they are not carrying an item, you may draw one at random from the token pouch and swap that instead. If you don't want the item drawn, leave it in the NPC's item slot and do not make a trade. The second thing they can do is to join your crew. If successful, the NPC will assist your crew by acting as one of your crew members for the remaining of the mission. We'll cover this in later videos with the full details and they can be activated in the current round. The third thing they can be persuaded to do is to make a mission specific action. Some missions will list extra things that you can persuade an NPC to do. For example, you may need to persuade a civilian in a bar to provide vital intel. This icon represents how difficult an NPC is to persuade and can be found on the character board. You must decide what you are persuading a character to do before rolling. Persuading a character works similarly to an attack. The number of combat dice rolled is equal to your character's skill statistic, the value on the character board, not the remaining number of pegs. The persuade value of the NPC works like armor, modifying your roll. If your roll beats their persuade value and scores a hit, the action is successful. Now let's look at the reload action. Reloading can only be done if a character is holding an ammo token and is not engaged with an enemy. When you reload, add the number of ammo pegs listed on the token to your dashboard up to the maximum. You will usually have to then flip the token or discard it and return it to the token pouch. And to show you which, whether you need to flip or discard, look out for these two icons. This one is to flip and this one is to discard. Final common action to look at is interact. Some missions will specify additional actions that can be made. These will be specific to the mission or terrain being used. Pick a lock, defuse a bomb, call an elevator, that kind of thing. Unless stated otherwise, to interact with an object, a trader must be in contact with it and unengaged. That's all the common actions now, but there are a few less common actions, so we'll go through three of them now. But this, these aren't an exhaustive list. There may be other actions that are used in specific missions or only when a character has a particular skill. 
They will be detailed in the appropriate place and really easy to know when you need to use them. So the first of these less common actions are clear jam. This action unjams a ranged weapon and can only be done when not engaged with an enemy. The next is to don or remove armor. Armor cannot be put straight into your character's armor slot. It takes time to put it on. When picked up, it should be placed in the item tray. This action is used to move or swap an armor token from the tray to the armor slot or vice versa. This can only be done when not engaged with an enemy. And then the final less common action is to stand up. This action allows a prone character to return to their feet, standing the model upright. They act normally from then on. That brings us to the end of the common and less common actions. And so come and join me for the next video where we'll look at effortless actions and also look at using our skills and defeated characters before we move on to the purge phase. Everything we go through in this how to play core space video series is taken from the core space rulebook and you can buy this separately or find it as part of the core space starter set. And if you haven't got this set already, then I can highly recommend it. And I've done a video where I've unboxed all the contents and gone through it in loads of detail so you can see exactly what's included and a little bit about the game. So if you'd like to check that out, I'll put links in the description below to Battle Systems website where you can get all their products, but also Element Games where you can save up to 20%. And you can also watch videos on how to build the terrain and all the different components that come with it. And then I've done another video where we go through all the tokens and cards in lots of detail too. I've also done videos where you can learn how to paint both Ariana and all the other miniatures that come in that core set. So check out those videos if you're interested in painting your miniatures and I can highly recommend doing that. I hope you enjoyed this video and it'd be great to see you in the next video of the series. Please like if you like it, subscribe for more videos like this and don't forget to hit the notification bell to join me next time on Tabletop Skirmish Games. If you like this kind of content and would like to support the channel, then please check out my Patreon page. And thanks to everyone who's joined so far. It's really awesome. We hang out on Discord, talk about the hobby, share ideas and help each other out. And you'll get some perks there that you're not going to find anywhere else. So I'll put a link in the description. It'll be great to see you there.